So in this lecture, we're going to go from particles to quantum fields. So we'll start by considering again the theory of a single relativistic quantum particle, the same theory we talked about in the first lecture, and we will uh, look at it in a little bit more detail. In particular, we'll work out exactly how Lorentz transformations uh, act on states in that theory. Um, so that will sort of justify the causality problem that we derived in the first lecture. Uh, then we're going to uh, start, we're going to explain how this causality problem is resolved when we include uh, particle creation and annihilation. So the first step is we will introduce the states that we need to describe more than one particle at a time. Uh, we'll introduce operators on that space, and uh, then we will show that you can uh, resolve the causality paradox if the theory is formulated in terms of observables, which are uh, local operators, Hermitian operators, uh, that depend on a particular point in space-time, and that satisfy local equations of motion. In other words, we'll be led right back to the idea that causality problems are resolved by quantum fields. Okay, okay so let's start uh, going back to this, uh, the idea of describing a single uh, non-interacting quantum uh, particle, relativistic particle, and so uh, the complete set of states is given by the momentum eigenstates, and these have the conventional normalization, just as a non-relativistic quantum mechanics <clears throat> the overlap between two momentum states is just a delta function. Okay? So now let's ask, how do these states transform under Lorentz transformations? Well, Lorentz transformations have to act as a unitary transformation. So if we have any state psi, then a Lorentz transformation gives rise to a new state, psi prime, and that new state is given by a unitary operator acting on the original state. And of course, this unitary operator depends on the Lorentz transformation. So here lambda is the uh, Lorentz transformation that we've been talking about, this thing with uh, four space-time indices. And this transformation has to be unitary so that it uh, preserves the overlap between wave functions. So it transforms one system into a unitarily equivalent uh, second system. Okay? So how does this, what is this action? Well, if we start with a state, let's look at this uh, unitary transformation, this transformation acting on a state P. Well, if this uh, state P describes a particle with momentum P, then clearly the Lorentz transform state has to be a, describe a particle with the Lorentz transformed momentum. And so it's very natural to just define this uh, operator by saying that it takes P, the state P, to the state P prime, where this is the Lorentz transformed state. Now we'll see actually that this is not quite right, so I'll put a question mark there, okay? But before we explain why it's not quite right, I need to explain exactly what this means. Um, none of this looks very covariant, and we're not used to thinking of Lorentz transformations as acting on three momenta. But what we have to remember is that these, this describes particles of a given mass, m. And so if we know the three momentum and we know the mass, we also know the energy. So we can define, we have the energy is just given by this formula, which we've written now several times. The energy associated with a three momentum is given by this. And that allows us to define a four momentum, which is just the uh, energy as the time component and the three momentum as the spatial components. So if we transform this four vector, we get a well-defined four vector, a Lorentz transformation of that, and it will also have mass m, it will have this form, but with a different p, a p prime, and that's what we mean here. Okay, okay so uh, now what I'm going to show is that this guess right here is actually not quite correct, all right, and the reason it's not quite correct is that the transformation defined in this way is not unitary. So let's see that. <clears throat> so to check to see whether it's unitary, let's compute u dagger lambda u lambda. Okay, so we want to see whether or not that is one. Okay, and so we'll just compute it by sandwiching it 
between two of our momentum states. Okay? And uh, we know how to, count, to, to evaluate this. This just gives us the, the uh, state P prime. And over here, this U dagger acts on here and gives me Q prime. And so this whole thing is just going to be uh, Q prime, P prime. Okay? That's what we get. Now, in order for this thing to be unitary, what we want is U dagger U to be 1. So what we want is for this to be just equal to what we get by replacing this by 1, which is just the overlap of Q and P. Okay? Now, this right here is just a delta function, P minus Q. And this right here is just a delta function. Sorry, these are P primes. And this guy right here is a delta function, P minus Q, without the primes. Okay? And are these things equal? Well, not exactly. They're equal up to a normalization. Okay? So they're not exactly equal, but we're very close. All right? So we just need to fix things up by normalizing the states in a different way. Okay? So let's see how to do that. Okay, so uh, let's look at the completeness relation for the states that we're using. Okay, this is the com standard completeness relation. This is equivalent to the statement that the overlap is just a delta function. Now, you can see that things are not Lorentz invariant here from the fact that this measure, integrating over only the spatial parts of P, uh, is obviously not a Lorentz invariant thing to do. And so, obviously, this is not Lorentz invariant. Okay. So what we really want to do is we want to integrate over these momenta in a Lorentz invariant way. So what we really want is to integrate over all four momenta, p mu, that satisfy p squared equals m squared, where this here means the square of the four momentum, p mu, p mu, which is the same as p zero squared minus p vector squared. Right? So this is the Lorentz invariant square of the four momentum, and the, the Lorentz invariant way of saying that this has, particle has mass m is that p squared equals m squared. Okay? Um, so now, what does this look like? If we go to the p space, if we have p0 this way and p vector this way, then the solutions to this equation, p squared equals m squared, are these hyperboloids here. There are two hyperboloids. And we actually want to integrate only over the top hyperboloid. Okay? So what we're going to do, therefore, is uh, we're going to write uh, some new states. Okay? We're, we're, sorry, we're going we're to integrate. We're going to integrate in a Lorentz invariant way over this hyperboloid. So suppose we have some function f of the four momentum p. We want to integrate it over that in a Lorentz invariant way. Well, what we do is we first of all we start by integrating over all four momenta. So this is a Lorentz invariant measure, and then we'll put in this delta function which basically forces the four momenta to live on one of these two hyperboloids. Okay? Then we need to restrict to the upper hyperboloid, so we write a theta function, theta of P0. Okay? Now this gives us, this is a manifestly Lorentz invariant way of integrating over just the top hyperboloid. Uh, the, this doesn't look manifestly Lorentz invariant, but it is a fact that at least the proper Lorentz transformations they preserve the sign of the time component of any four vector. That's a fact about uh, Lorentz transformations that you can check. Um, and so what we want to do is we want to uh, integrate some function f of the four momentum in this way. Okay? So uh, let's, uh, we can actually do the integral over p0 here. Okay? And if we do that integral, we'll be left with an integral over d cubed p. So we're doing the integral using this delta function. This delta function tells us what p0 has to be. Together with this theta function, it basically tells us that p0 has to be equal to this e of p that we've been talking about. Right? And so, what, but there's an, what we get is not just the integral over f of p. We actually get this extra factor here. Sorry, e of p. So we get an integral d cubed p, we get this extra factor, and then f evaluated where p0 equals this e of p. Okay. Now where did this extra factor here come from? There's a, uh, 
a, uh, uh, it comes from the fact that the argument of the delta function is not just p0. So there's a general formula for uh, if we have an integral over some parameter x, and a delta function of g of x times f of x, uh, this delta function is non-zero only at the points where g vanishes. So this is going to be a sum over uh, points where x of n, where g is zero, and then we're going to get a factor of f of xn, so we're evaluating the function at each of these points where g is zero, but then there's this extra factor of one over g prime of xn, the magnitude, and this can be thought of as arising from the Jacobian. If we change variables from x to g, then this delta function just evaluates f at the zeros of that, but uh, there's an extra factor from the Jacobian, and that's this one over g prime, and that's the source of this extra factor right here. Okay? So we see that with a small modification, instead of integrating over just d cubed p, if we divide by this, if we include this factor right here, then this is a Lorentz invariant way of, um, of, of, of integrating. Okay? So, good. <coughs> So let's uh, use this to define a new set of states that we call P. So notice the big difference. There's no three, there's no little three vector symbol on top of this. So this is going to, here we're supposed to, the way you're supposed to think of this is that here P means a four vector, okay? So this slight notational change indicates states that are really completely different. And then we're going to normalize these things by writing the completeness relation in this way, d cubed p to e of p. Okay, well actually let me write this as uh, p zero, and then we have p p. Okay, uh, let me just go ahead and write this as e of p. There we go. Okay, so the idea is that here this is the Lorentz invariant measure. Okay, and here are the states. Okay, the states. Okay, and. Um, well, yeah, we could write this in the manifestly Lorentz invariant way that I wrote before, or in just in this way right here. And here you can see that, well, one is certainly invariant under Lorentz transformations. This measure is, and so this projector onto these states is also Lorentz invariant. And you can see the relationship between these states and the previous ones. It's just coming from uh, this factor right here. So uh, since this involves two states, the relationship involves the square root of these states. Um, and, and actually, I'm sorry, uh, I, I forgot something here. Uh, this should be d cubed p over 2 pi cubed. This 2 pi cubed is a purely conventional factor, but it's, it's conventional, so let's put it in, okay? So we put in this factor right here, and then we see that the normalization is there's this factor of 2 pi to the 3 halves. There's the square root of this factor, e to the 2 p, and here's p vector, okay? So there's no, nothing really deep going on here. These states are just some different normalization uh, from the conventional ones that we're used to, but this will enable us to, uh, to write things in a more uh, manifestly covariant way. So, uh, for example, uh, if we look at the overlap between two of these relativistically normalized states, obviously from this formula right here, this is 2 pi cubed, 2 e of p, delta uh, cubed of uh, p minus q, okay? And so <clears throat> what we've basically shown is that this right here is in fact a Lorentz invariant uh, delta function. This is actually a Lorentz invariant form of the delta function uh, on this mass shell of these particles of mass m, okay? Okay, so Uh, with the terms of these relativistically normalized states, we have u of lambda of p is just p prime. So now there's no question mark. There's no question mark here. And the fact that if you go through the same calculation that we went through here, uh, that you went through before to check unitarity, this time it works. And the basic reason is that uh, the Lorentz invariance of that delta function that I just wrote down before, the fact that q p is equal to q prime p prime, where these things are just Lorentz transformations uh, of these guys. Okay. 
Okay, so now we have a unitary transformation, uh, a unitary action of Lorentz transformation on our states. Okay, okay, good. So now we've sort of seen that how Lorentz transformations act. Okay, but the next thing we want to do, the next thing we want to understand is the Hamiltonian. Now the Hamiltonian is not a covariant object either. The Hamiltonian t uh, tells us what the time evolution of the system is, but time is not a priori well defined. So what we really want uh, is what we want is a four vector operator, right? The Hamiltonian is the energy that is the time component of the momentum four vector. So we want this thing. We want an operator p mu, okay, and uh, it should have the property that p mu acting on these states p is the four momentum times p, right? So this is one of those pp equals pp formulas from quantum mechanics. This is an operator. This is a state. This is the C number eigenvalue, okay? And so um, actually, well, here it is. This defines the action of p mu, <laughs> okay? It seems a little bit like cheating, but it isn't, right? I have given you the, I've told you that these uh, states, uh, these momentum eigenstates are, that, well, they're a complete set of states, and I've asserted that they're, uh, that they're in fact, eigenstates of this full four-momentum operator, okay? So now, uh, this, has been a, this is obviously a pretty abstract definition of the theory, and so in uh, one of your homework assignments, you'll actually rewrite this theory in the more conventional language of wave functions uh, and uh, Schrodinger equations and so on, okay? But for right now, uh, we'll just go on with this, okay? Okay, so now that we have, so we have now some operator, we have this operator p mu, and we have the states, and so let's talk a little bit about how Lorentz transformations actually act. Do they act on states? Do they act on operators? Do they act on both? Okay, but uh, the, the answer is that they, 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 they have to the answer is that they can act on either states or on operators, but not on both. And so I want to explain that. Okay? So what we really need uh, for, for physics is that we, we have matrix elements, like for example, we have matrix elements between our, our P and Q states, and we have our operator P mu, and this is a matrix element. Okay? And this matrix element is supposed to transform like a four vector. right? And so if we want this to transform like a four vector, then what we need is uh, we need either the states or the operator to transform as a four vector. Okay? So uh, let's first of all let's look at so let's look at the case where the states transform. Okay? Uh, one, one way of implementing this is to transform the states and leave the operators fixed. So we take the states to transform under this unitary transformation, but the operators, okay, do not transform, okay? And so if we do that, what we can see is that this thing up here, how does it transform? Well, it transforms like, uh, well, let's just cut to the chase. These guys, these states right here just transform into uh, Q prime uh, P mu uh, P prime, Right? The, the states just transform into their Lorentz transform things. Now, this p mu just gives me the eigen, uh, gives, this p prime is an eigenstate, so what I get is just p prime mu q prime p prime. Okay? And if I want, since this, uh, this thing here is Lorentz invariant, this is the same as q p. Okay? So if I say that uh, the states transform and the operators do not, I get the uh, correct statement that I want, namely that this thing right here, this thing right here transforms like a four vector, as it should. Okay? So this uh, picture where the states transform but the operators do not, this is like Schrodinger picture for time evolution. So this is the Schrodinger picture for how Lorentz transformations act. And really, this is not a misuse of that term because uh, at the end of the day, we'll be interested in theories that have time translation symmetry. And so time translation is both a symmetry, but it's also time evolution. So when we have Schrodinger picture, time translation acts on the states. That's the same thing as saying that the states 
actually evolve with time and the operators do not. That's Schrodinger picture. All right. Now, for quantum field theory, it's actually uh, generally more useful to consider the Heisenberg picture where the operators transform. But the states do not. Okay? So if that happens, what happens is the states, as I said, the states do not transform. And how do the operators transform? Well, they have to transform in such a way that these matrix elements transform the same way as before, right? Trans because those are the those are the physical things. Uh, and so the way it has to work is I have a U dagger lambda O U lambda. Okay? And so uh, let's just check that, okay? Uh, I think I'm going to run out of room, but let's go ahead and do it up here anyway. So here now, the operator is going to transform. So I have my uh, u dagger of lambda uh, p mu u lambda uh, p, okay? So sorry if that's probably getting off the screen there. Okay, but I'm just putting in the transformation. Now what is this? Well, this u of lambda acts on this p, this u dagger of lambda acts on this q, and I get just exactly what I had before. Okay, I have my, I have a, I, it, this thing turns this q into a q prime and this p into a p prime. Okay, so this is just what I had before, and so uh, these two things give exactly the same answer on uh, matrix elements like this, um, as they must. Okay, so. <clears throat> So let me introduce some terminology. This function u of lambda that we have found is actually a representation. We say that this is a representation of the Lorentz group. So we're thinking of lambda as being the actual Lorentz transformations, the actual 4 by 4 matrices that give the Lorentz transformations. Uh, but this u of lambda is an operator which depends on that and which actually implements the Lorentz transformations on either the states or the operators. Okay, um, and there are certain uh, mathematical properties that this representation has to have, right? Uh, one property that it has to have is that uh, I can take a Lorentz transformation, which is the product of two Lorentz transformations, lambda one and lambda two. That gives me a new Lorentz transformation, just call it lambda 3. Well, if I have this kind of a rule, then it must be the case that u of lambda 1 times u of lambda 2 is u of lambda 3, right? So that's just to say that, uh, that the, 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 these u's give the same, if I combine a Lorentz transformation lambda 1 and lambda 2, that's the same as do it combining the u's, basically. And, you know, it's the same thing. I think it's, it's easier to appreciate it than actually to say it. Okay? And uh, note in particular that also implies that if I take the inverse, if I take u of the inverse Lorentz transformation, lambda inverse, um, then this is u inverse of lambda, which is the same as u dagger, but I'll just write it like this. Okay? So a function, uh, or a, a, a u of lambda that satisfies these criteria is called a representation, and because u is unitary, it's called a unitary representation of Lorentz group. Okay? So one of the things that we've seen is that these particle states actually form a unitary representation of the Lorentz group. And this sort of language is useful because it turns out that you can actually classify, mathematically classify, these unitary uh, representations of the Lorentz group. Uh, this was done by Wigner, and we'll, we'll talk about this a little later in the course. And you can uh, show then that the representations, these unitary representations, which are all the possible particle states that you can have, uh, are labeled entirely by their mass and spin. And so we can really understand what all possible particles look like that are relativistic uh, in this way. Okay, so that was a little aside on group representations, something that we'll come back to in a little bit. Uh, so now I'm pretty much done talking about single particle states, so now we're going to go on to multi-particle states. Right? We saw in the introductory lecture that if we just restrict ourselves to a state of a single particle, there's no way to have causality. Even the free uh, particle 
violates causality. So, and we argued heuristically that the solution was going to be to uh, allow particle creation and annihilation. So what we need to do is we first need to understand how to construct states that describe more than one particle. Okay? So the way we do it is following along just what we've done before. Uh, we'll, we'll do is we'll say if we want to construct a state of two particles. Well, we just write it down. We say that we have uh, states P1, P2. Okay? Now, this is supposed to be an eigenstate of the total momentum operator, where with total momentum P1 plus P2, so we're assuming that there's going to be the, uh, the four momentum operator will give you the sum of the four momenta for these things. And uh, yeah, these particles, this is the state is supposed to describe two particles. Okay? But now there's something more. We want this to describe two indistinguishable particles. Okay? So, for example, if we want to describe two electrons, there's not Fred electrons and Ginger electrons, there's just one kind of electron. And if you look at a state where the electrons are like this, and you interchange the two electrons, you can't tell any difference between them. Every electron is exactly the same. So, one thing that that means is that uh, both of these momenta, four momenta, have the same mass. We're describing one type of particle with uh, a particular kind of mass. Right? But more fundamentally, what it means is that if I look at the state P1, P2, and the state P2, P1, right, that these are physically the same state. They are indistinguishable. Okay? And so uh, there has to be some intimate relationship between these two. Okay? And it turns out that there are only two possibilities, okay? which is that if I reverse the order of these guys, so P2, P1 is equal to either plus uh, P1, P2, or minus P1, P2. Okay? Uh, and this, this right here, this is the case of bosons, and this is the case of fermions. Okay? Now, in general, there could, you could imagine that there could be other possibilities. You could imagine that somehow there are phases here that might depend on the momenta, they might depend on various other things, uh, but it turns out that there are very, very strong constraints on these kinds of factors, okay? And in, in three, three plus one dimensions that we're mostly interested in, uh, this is the only possibility, and you can prove that. That was, uh, again, originally done by Wigner, and <coughs> there's a very nice detailed discussion of this in Weinberg's quantum field theory book. So I'm not going to uh, go through this, I'm just going to accept this result, that there are these two uh, possibilities, and in fact, for the rest of this lecture, I'm going to focus on the possibility of bosons. It's the simplest possibility. Um, and, but, of course, we'll have to return to fermions later. Fermions are certainly uh, important. Okay? So what we're left with, then, is if we do this, we're, we're, we're saying that the multiparticle states, in general, are states that are labeled by n four momenta, like this. And uh, it doesn't matter what order you put these things in, you get the same state. That's basically what this says. Okay? Okay. So let's define the normalization of these states. Okay, so to really define these states, we need their, their, their normalization. And so let's just do it for two particles. We'll have q1, q2, p1, p2. Uh, clearly, if states uh, have different numbers of particles, we're going to say that they are orthogonal, right? Those, those, are, those are completely different states. So if we have the same number of particles, what does it look like? Well, we're going to do sort of the obvious thing. We're going to say that this is Q1, P1, uh, Q2, P2, uh, plus Q1, P2, Q2, P1. In other words, these two states are orthogonal unless uh, they have exactly the same pairs of four momenta here. Okay, But it could be that these are equal and these are equal, or it could be that these are equal and these are equal. So we have these two terms here. And these uh, one particle overlap things are just the Lorentz invariant delta functions, right? So this is, uh, we're using, we're skipping right ahead and using uh, a Lorentz invariant normalization for these states, okay? Um, okay, and in general, for uh, n 
particle states, you see what we do. We have to sum over all of the possible ways that the Q's could be equal to the P's, right? So we have something like Q1 through Qn overlap with P1. Pn is equal to, well, there's a Q1, P1 up through Qn, Pn, but then there are all the other possible ways that this thing, uh, that these two momenta could be the same. So plus permutations. Okay, so there would be a total of uh, n factorial terms in this sum if we have an n particle state. Okay? Now, it's useful to define a bigger space of states that includes all of the states with any number of particles. So we're going to include the one particle states, the two particle states, three particle states, and so on, all in one big space. And we're also going to include the no particle state, which we'll denote by zero. So all of these are together in one big space that we call uh, Fox space. Okay. Um, now, the zero particle state is defined by the property that uh, it is normalized to one, and it's orthogonal to all of these things. So it's supposed to represent uh, the state with, with, with no particles. And sometimes I'm going to slip up and call it what it's called when we get to quantum field theory, which is the vacuum state. At the end of the day, it'll turn out to be the ground state of quantum field theory. But it's, I'm supposed to say no particle state in this part of the lecture. Okay? Now, uh, this is obviously the right space of states to use if we're going to have processes that create and destroy particles. But for right now, it's just a mathematical device. Okay? And um, as I said, uh, each of these different kinds of states are orthogonal to each other. For example, the uh, zero particle state is, is orthogonal to one particle states, two particle states are orthogonal to one particle states, and so on. So now we have the, the, the states, and we know the inner products of all of these states. Okay? So now the next step is going to be to actually define operators that act on this state. And we want to define the most general operators. And the most general set of operators uh, that we can have, the most general operators on this space, can be written in terms of creation and annihilation operators. These operators are very analogous to the raising and lowering operators that you've encountered in the operator solution of the simple harmonic oscillator. And there's a, there's, this is no accident. Uh, the reason for that is that when we, as we'll see, the, the system of uh, uh, a free the, the, the theory that describes free quantum particles is actually equivalent to an infinite number of harmonic oscillators. Uh, but for right now, we're going to completely ignore that connection because we're trying to build up the theory sort of uh, from starting from the properties of particle states. So we're just going to define these operators as they act on particle states and work out some of their properties. Okay? All right. So the way that these uh, creation and annihilation operators are defined is by the following uh, equation. The n particle state is gotten by acting with n of these creation property uh, operators on the zero particle state. Okay? So this kind of formula should look familiar from the harmonic oscillator. We to get the, uh, the to, well anyway, this is we have n creation operators acting on the zero particle states give us an, an n particle state. Okay? Now, it's not immediately obvious, but it is the case that this formula actually uniquely determines all of the matrix elements of uh, alpha, okay? alpha dagger. Okay? So to see this, notice that, for example, if I take alpha of k acting on uh, an n particle state, um, well, this right here is just got gotten by uh, the formula above, acting by n creation operators on the zero particle state, and this guy just adds one more. So I just get the state k, p1 through pn. Okay? So you can see that it, it, its action on the n particle states is actually determined by, by, this, uh, by this equation right here. Okay? Um, so uh, that completely determines the action of, uh, of, of, of alpha dagger. And 
since that therefore also completely determines the action of alpha. Okay, so let's work out the action of, of, of alpha. Okay, so if we take, um, okay, so if we take, um, let's take a matrix element Q1 through Qm, alpha of k, P1 through Pn. So let's work out what this is. Okay, so now uh, we can work this out simply by relating this to the matrix elements of alpha dagger using the definition, which is that we re reverse these things, P1 through Pn, alpha dagger of K, Q1 through Qm, and take the complex conjugate, okay? So this is giving us the matrix elements of uh, alpha dagger, okay? And now we can work out what this is. This is just P1 through Pn, and then we add K, Q1 through Qm, and then at the end of the day, we have to take the, the complex conjugate, okay? So this is the overlap between an m plus 1 particle state and an n particle state. So we see that this is non-zero only if m is equal to n minus 1, okay? So coming back up here, that immediately tells us that, uh, that alpha of k acting on an n particle state, uh, it gives us a state which is an n minus 1 particle state. So that is, uh, so this, this one actually removes one of the particles, okay? And uh, furthermore, this matrix element right here is non-zero only if these sets of momenta are exactly the same set of these momenta. Uh, and so this thing is e going to be equal to, uh, so k has to be equal to one of the pi's, so we could have, we would have uh, some sum, well, anyway, I'm not going to write this out, but this is a sum of uh, the products of delta functions that say that all of these things uh, should be equal to each other, right? This, this set of momenta is the same as this set of momenta, but the order doesn't matter since we're looking at bosons, okay? Okay, um, and actually I'll leave it as an exercise, but you can work out the following explicit formula for the annihilation operator. Um, It follows from what I've just, just written out, that if I take this thing, the annihilation operator, alpha of k, acting on this thing right here, that this is going to be equal to sum of i equals 1 to n of uh, k pi. So this, uh, it's non-zero only if this k is among the set of these guys. And then the operator, the state that multiplies this is p1 pi, pn, okay, where I omit pi, okay? So in other words, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's that, that this is a, a sum of n minus 1 particle states where k is equal to the momentum that, of the particle that I have removed, okay? And as a special case of this, if I act on the zero particle state with alpha, I just get zero. I get the zero vector state. Okay? All right. And so, as I've uh, already said, we refer to alpha dagger as a creation operator and alpha as an annihilation operator. Okay? So, what I've shown now is that the uh, matrix elements of the creation and annihilation operators are completely determined by that formula that I wrote down at the beginning. Okay? So, now that we know all the matrix elements of the operators, alpha and alpha dagger, we know everything about them. And so we should be able to compute, for example, their commutators. Okay, so let's do that. Um, so let me just, just to remind myself, remember that this was the formula that I started with, that if we act on the vacuum with these n creation operators, we just get the n particle state, right? And uh, it's, it's the order of these p's doesn't matter, that was the Bose statistics, and so the orders of these alpha daggers doesn't matter. So that means that alpha dagger of P, uh, alpha dagger of Q equals zero, right? And taking the dagger of this equation, alpha of P and alpha of Q is zero. So the alpha daggers all commute, the different alpha daggers all commute with each other, and the different alphas all commute with each other, okay? 
Now, there is a non-trivial commutator if I calculate, um, how do I want to write it, uh, alpha of p, alpha dagger of q. Okay? So this is non-zero. Okay? So let's work this out. Let's work out this commutator. Okay? Okay, so to work it out, let's first work out uh, alpha of p, alpha dagger of q, okay? And let's, uh, we want to work this out on an arbitrary state, so we'll work it out on a state p1 through pn, okay? So now, what does alpha of q do? It just adds another particle, so this is alpha of p, q, p1 through pn, okay? And what does alpha do? Well, it removes one particle, okay? But this particle has to be in there. P has to be in there somewhere, right? And so the, I get one term when P is equal to Q, and that's proportional to P, Q. And then I omit Q, I get P1 through Pn, okay? So I get that term, right? And then there's a, another term like this when P is equal to P1, P2, and so on, right? So I get a sum from I equals 1 to N of the state, sorry, of, first of all, there's the overlap of P, 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 I, okay? So this P has to be equal to one of these uh, P1 through Pn, and then that multiplies the state with Q, uh, P1 through Pi, Pn, and I omit Pi, okay? So this is using the formula that I just wrote down for the annihilation operator, okay? All right, now let's do it in the other order. I have alpha of alpha dagger of Q, alpha of P, acting on P1 through Pn. Now I have to do it in this order, okay? Uh, so now this annihilation operator uh, has to be, this P has to be one of these Pi's, which I've just, similar to what I've just had before. So I have my alpha dagger of Q, which I still have sitting off to the left, then I have the sum, i equals 1 to n. I have my matrix elements, p, p, i. And then each one of these multiplies one of these states, p1, p, i, through p, n, omitting p, i. Okay? And now I have to do the alpha dagger of q, but that just adds a q to the state that I had. So I have sum of i equals 1 to n, p, p, i. Q, P1 up to Pi up to Pn. Okay? And so what you see is that uh, doing it in these two different orders, I'm getting almost exactly the same thing, right? Uh, but not quite. Uh, I, this term right here is exactly the same as this term right here. So the only difference between these two things is this term right here, okay? So if you put all of that together, what you find is recycling that little bit of chalk up here. This, okay? It says that this commutator is non-zero only if p is equal to q, and it's in fact just given by this overlap or this Lorentz invariant delta function right here. Okay? So those are the commutation relations. And again, this should remind you, uh, is this will remind us later about of the commutation relations for, uh, for raising and lowering operators in the harmonic oscillator. Okay? Okay, and it's not very hard to see that actually we can write any operator whatsoever in terms of these creation and annihilation operators, because any operator is defined by its matrix elements, and I can always put together combinations of raising and lowering operators to get any matrix elements that I want. Okay, so this is a, uh, this is these creation and, uh, and annihilation operators are sort of the building blocks for all possible operators, okay? Um, now, I want to emphasize that uh, I've, you know, not only introduced states with different numbers of particles, and then I've introduced uh, operators that create and destroy particles. It seems like 
maybe it seems like it would be inevitable that if I follow just the formalism is going to force me to create and destroy particles, but I want to emphasize that that is not the case. So uh, if I look at operators that have uh, n creation operators and the same number of uh, an annihilation operators, operators like this will only have matrix elements between states with the same number of particles. So this is called uh, an n-body operator, okay, and it has matrix elements between any states p1 through pm, so m doesn't have to be equal to n, and this thing here will again be an n part, sorry, m particle state. Okay, so, uh, and in fact, in condensed matter physics, this sort of formalism with creation and annihilation operators and n-body operators is actually useful even in situations where you don't create or destroy particles. So it's not only, it's actually even useful, but uh, right here what's important is that I'm not committed to have interactions that create and destroy particles because I could just write everything in terms of operators of this form. Okay? Okay. So um, as an example of this, as an example of this kind of an operator, let's look at the uh, four-momentum operator. Uh, earlier in this lecture, we defined the four momentum operator in this sort of tricky way. For one particle states, we defined it as p mu uh, p equals p mu p. We just said that the one particle states were uh, eigenstates of the four momentum operator. So I could define uh, it axiomatically for n particle states in the same way. I could just assert that this is equal to uh, this is an uh, I, uh, this, this, this n particle state is an, a p mu eigenstate with the obvious eigenvalue, which is the sum of the four momenta of the individual particles. Okay? So I could just define it in this way, but let's actually see what this operator is, p mu, written in terms of creation and annihilation operators. Okay? And I claim it's the thing which is perhaps uh, obvious in hindsight. Let me just write it down. Uh, we have this integral uh, dp, and uh, this means the Lorentz invariant integral over momenta, for momenta p on the mass shell, and I'll write that down in a second. Then I weight this by p mu, and then I have alpha dagger p alpha of q. Okay? Um, so now what do I mean by this here? Uh, this integral right here means, uh, it could, I can write it as d4 p over 2 pi to the fourth, uh, 2 pi delta p squared minus m squared theta of p0, okay? So I can write this integral, uh, this, this measure is the Lorentz invariant measure over the uh, hyperboloid, and this is equivalent to uh, d cubed p over 2 pi cubed, this famous factor 1 over 2 e of p, uh, times whatever, okay? So this is the Lorentz invariant measure that we've talked about before. This is just an abbreviation for that that I'll find useful, okay? So I'm asserting that p mu is given by this formula right here. So let, let's check that, okay? <clears throat> All right. So um, let's just check it on uh, one particle states, and I'll leave you checking it on, on higher particle states, I'll leave that as an exercise. So we'll do p mu acting on a state uh, uh, p, okay? Now, if we're gonna use this formula, let's, let's not call this p also, because this is a dummy uh, variable, so we'll call this uh, d, let's say k, k mu, alpha dagger k, alpha of k, all of this is acting on the state p, okay? So I've just renamed this, uh, okay? And now what is this? Alpha of k acting on p is just kp, okay? And this is the Lorentz invariant delta function. But now, integrating the Lorentz invariant delta function over the Lorentz invariant measure just does the integral for me and turns the k's into p's. And so I get just p mu alpha dagger of p. Oh, sorry. This right here, I forgot to write the state. Uh, th this thing is non-zero only if k is equal to p. Alpha reduces the number of particles and turns the one particle state into the zero particle state. So then I have uh, the vacuum here, or the zero particle state, okay? And then this is just equal to the state p, okay? 
So what you can see is, and, and, and now I leave it as an exercise to check that in fact this also works on the uh, end particle state. It's really an exercise you should do. It's worth doing um, to get some familiarity with this. And so, yeah, anyway, P mu is given by this formula right here. Okay? Okay. All right. So what do we, what's next? Now we have to look at... Um, Let's just go to position space, okay? So we have these, uh, these, these, these alphas, uh, alpha daggers, and we've defined everything so that the states are Lorentz invariant and so on. So we're just sort of one step away from being able to define operators in position space that transform simply under Lorentz transformations. So let's do that, okay? So, um, Okay, so we're going to define position space fields that I'll call phi plus, and this is a, an ancient and venerable name. And this is basically, uh, this is gotten by taking our Lorentz invariant integration measure uh, in Fourier transforming alpha of p, i to the e to the i p x, okay? And this plus, this is not a dagger, this is a plus, this is, an inter, uh, this is a notation introduced, I think, by Pauli a long, long time ago. Um, and the plus is uh, related to the fact that this is a positive uh, frequency. Okay? And what this means is that if I look at this exponential right here, this is e to the minus i. Well, remember, in this thing here, p0 is going to be turned into plus e of p. So this is going to look at you know, e of pt. Okay? And this time dependence with a minus i in the exponent is the sort of correct sign for positive energy propagation in quantum mechanics, okay? So there is actually some logic to this plus here, despite what Sidney Coleman says in his, his notes. Um, yeah, okay? But anyway, it's just a convention. It's not a, not a big deal. And then phi minus of x is just uh, the thing where we take dp, alpha dagger of p e to the plus i p dot x. In other words, it's just the dagger, the Hermitian conjugate of phi plus, and it has a plus sign here, but that is the sort of wrong sign of the, so to speak, of the, 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 the time evolution, and so it's called minus, and this is called negative frequency. Okay? Okay. Now, um, okay, so notice that when we took this Fourier transform, in order to make the, the, everything Lorentz covariant, we actually allowed these fields to depend on time, okay? So, and remember that, every, that, that alpha here is an operator, and so this is an operator as well, okay? So we have an operator that depends on time, and that's sort of required by Lorentz, trans, uh, sorry, Lorentz invariance. And so from this you can sort of see that what we want is we want to be working in Heisenberg picture, right? We're going to be looking at a situation where operators depend on time, and therefore we're also eventually going to be interested in, when we look at the transformations under Lorentz transformations, we want to have the, uh, the operators transforming and the states not transforming. We want to use Heisenberg picture for the uh, Lorentz transformations as well. But before we do that, let's, let's, since Schrodinger picture is a little more familiar, let's, let's start with that. So in the Schrodinger picture, okay, the uh, states, okay, the states, uh, well, I'll just write the one particle states transform. So they go into the Fourier transform, sorry, the, not Fourier transform, the Lorentz transforms uh, state, uh, uh, states lambda p, and uh, the, the, the alpha of p, right, the operators, for example, don't transform, right? Whereas in Heisenberg picture, it's the other way around. We don't have the states transforming, the states stay fixed. But alpha of p, it, in order to have the same matrix elements, uh, it transforms into, um, uh, if you work it out, it actually has to be alpha inverse of p. Okay? So I claim that this is what has to happen here in Heisenberg picture. So let's, to, to, uh, to see that this is the case, we have this lambda inverse here, let's just compute a matrix element in both Schrodinger picture and uh, Heisenberg picture. So I'll leave this here. And let's check. 
check this. Okay. All right. Um, so let's look at the matrix element. It's a non-zero, um, a non-zero thing here. P, Q. Okay. So let's look to see how this uh, how this thing transforms. First of all, if we just evaluate this in the original frame, this thing becomes P Q uh, zero zero. This is just one, and this right here is just the Lorentz invariant delta function. Okay. So that's what this thing is. Now, let's see how this thing transforms in Schrodinger picture. Okay? In Schrodinger picture, alpha doesn't change, but these guys transform. The zero particle state just transforms into itself. There's no particles to Lorentz transform. And uh, then I have alpha of p. That doesn't transform because I'm in Schrodinger picture. And then this thing just becomes lambda q. Right? The state transforms into lambda q. And so what I get here when I for this matrix element then is just, well, this I just get a p lambda q, right? We get the Lorentz invariant delta function between p and lambda q. Okay? So that's what happens when I take this matrix element and transform it using Schrodinger picture. Now I'm supposed to get the same answer if I use Heisenberg picture. So if I use Heisenberg picture, what happens is that uh, the states don't transform, but alpha supposedly transforms by this formula down here. So let's try it. Lambda inverse of p, but now the state doesn't transform here, q. This doesn't transform. Okay? Now, is, let's see, is that right? So this thing right here just gives me lambda inverse p overlap with q. Right? It just gives me this. So the question is, are these two things equal to each other? And the answer is yes, they are. Uh, this thing is only uh, non-zero if uh, p is equal to lambda q. This one is only non-zero if lambda inverse p equals q. But of course, these are the same conditions. Okay? And because this is a Lorentz invariant delta function, it is the case that p q is equal to p prime q prime, where these are the Lorentz transforms of these, so you can see that whether I have the Lorentz transformation on one side or the other doesn't change the answer. Okay? So we have seen that under Heisenberg picture, we have confirmed this result right down here. Okay? Okay, so now let's stick to Heisenberg picture. And ask, okay, in Heisenberg picture, how do these fields that I've defined, how do they transform? So phi plus of x, what I wrote down before is this is dp, uh, e to the minus i p dot x, alpha uh, of p. Yes. Okay? Um, okay, and so uh, how does this transform? Well, in Heisenberg picture, right, what happens is that uh, all that happens is that this guy right here transforms. So this becomes alpha of lambda inverse p. Okay? Um, now, what I want to do is, uh, oh, let me, let me write this as, sorry, let me write this as p prime, where this, where p prime is lambda inverse p. Okay? All right? So now what I want to do is I want to rewrite this in terms of, uh, uh, instead of an integral over p, I want to write it as an integral over p prime. Now the fact that the measure is Lorentz invariant tells me that this measure is just d of p prime. So that was easy. These things are just equal to each other. So now all I have to do is I have to take this term, p dot x, and I have to write it in terms of p prime. Okay? So uh, p dot x, what is that? Okay? Well that is uh, so, if p prime is lambda inverse p, then p is lambda p prime, right, after uh, a page or two of algebra. And so, uh, I find here that this is lambda p prime dot x, okay? Now, what turns out to be the case is that this is p prime times lambda inverse of x, okay? Now, this last step, this formula looks kind of funny, okay? Maybe it even looks wrong, but it is correct, okay? So I'm going to, uh, as a little aside, let's go ahead and, uh, and, and, and calculate this as a little exercise in index gymnastics, which will hopefully be uh, healthy for, for all of us, okay? So, um, but actually, sorry, 
before I, um, let's see, yeah, before I do that exercise, let me just see, let me just see what happens when I plug that in. So I'll, 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 I'll do this in a second. But then what I find here, continuing down here, this is now equal to, I have dp prime, okay, uh, the Lorentz invariant measure. Then I have e to the minus i p prime with lambda inverse x uh, up here. And then I have alpha of p prime, okay? Just using this result. And now you see that, well, p prime is just a dummy integration variable. It doesn't matter whether I call it p or p prime. I'm just integrating over all of them. So what I get here finally is my, this is the same function phi plus that I started with, but it's now evaluated at a new uh, space-time point, lambda inverse times x. Okay? So that's the result that I get. I get a nice simple result. So let me now, uh, I'll comment on that in a second, but now I need to, I owe you a derivation of this thing right here. So let's, let's do that. Okay? So what we want to look at is lambda p dot x, okay? We want to uh, evaluate that. So let's remember what this means, okay? So uh, this means uh, in matrix uh, index-free notation, this is lambda transpose p, sorry, let me, this is lambda transpose, let me write it in, 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 in index notation, okay? It's, um, sorry, I think this is probably too high. Let me write it down a little lower. Lambda p dot x is lambda p mu, eta mu nu, x nu. So I've been careful here to write everything in terms of upper uh, indices. And then that means that this I can write as lambda p transpose eta x. Okay. So here I'm using an index-free notation where this is a matrix, uh, this is a, and these are vectors. Okay. Um, and now... Uh, um, what I want to use is I want to use uh, the basic identity that uh, the, the basic identity that says that the the metric the space-time metric is Lorentz invariant, and that met, may, as what that identity says it says that lambda mu nu is lambda inverse is two lambda inverses contracted with eta, and the way the indices go there's a there's a mu here and a nu here. Those are the free indices here. And then the other indices, let's say rho and uh, sigma, are contracted here like this. Okay? So this is the basic identity that says that the metric is, in fact, Lorentz invariant. Okay? And um, I can write this in a matrix notation as saying that eta is equal to lambda inverse transpose uh, eta lambda inverse. Okay? So you have to be a little bit careful to get these transposes right. The idea is that the left index here, mu, is this, left in, is this right index here. So I have to put in a transpose to make the left index of this matrix expression match this one. The other indices all work out in a, in a, in a more simple way. Okay? And so if I use this identity right here and plug it into here, what do I have? So I have, first of all, let me work out this thing here. This is P transpose uh, lambda transpose, just taking the transpose here. Now for eta, I'm going to use this identity right here, lambda inverse transpose eta lambda inverse, and then I have my x. Okay, And you see that this lambda transpose and this lambda inverse transpose cancel. Okay, The inverse of the transpose is the same as the transpose of the inverse. That's easily checked. So it doesn't matter what order I do that. And so I finally end up with P transpose eta lambda inverse x, okay, which is what I said. This is P dot lambda inverse x going back to the sort of dot product type notation. Okay? Okay, so that finishes that up. All right. So uh, as we said, When we uh, plug this back into uh, phi plus, what we find is that phi plus of x goes to phi plus of lambda inverse times x. Okay, so we got all of this by sort of carefully following our noses. Um, you might be a little surprised by hmm, 
uh, why did that end up being lambda inverse there, not lambda? Okay. Um, so we can actually understand that in a very simple way. Okay. So let's, uh, for, to understand this, it doesn't really matter whether we're talking about a classical field, a quantum field, or a classical field. So let's just talk about a classical field, which we can visualize uh, better. Okay. So imagine we have some classical field configuration, phi plus, or let's just call it phi. Say so we have a classical field phi, and suppose that, that there's a special point y in space-time, and around this special point y is where the, uh, the, the phi is non-zero. So phi is non-zero in some region around y. Okay? And now let's consider a Lorentz transformation that acts on the, all the points here, and that Lorentz transformation will take this point y to some new point y prime. Okay? All right, so it'll take every point to some other point, but let's focus, it takes y in particular to y prime, okay? So that's how it acts on, uh, and, and, and y prime is obviously just lambda times y, right? That's how Lorentz transformations act, okay? Now, how do Lorentz transformations act on the fields, okay? Well, it's pretty clear that what it should be doing is it should take this field configuration that's localized around y and give us a new field configuration that is localized around y prime. So if we have our special point y and we have our new point y prime, the new field configuration, I'll call it phi prime, should be non-zero around here, right? So there used to be, the old field configuration was non-zero around here, okay? And so what we want to have is the new field configuration, phi prime, evaluated at y prime, should be equal to the old field configuration, phi, evaluated at y. Okay? That's what needs to happen. Now, I did this for the special point y where I said it was non-zero, but that was sort of for a dramatic effect. It's clear that this has to be true for every point x. So phi prime of x prime is phi of x. Okay? So the basic rule about the, the way that, this is the basic rule about the way that functions transform under space-time, scalar fields transform under space-time transformations, okay? And you can see that x prime is equal to lambda x, and so that gives us the, uh, uh, the, the relationship we need, because phi prime of x, the new function, is now equal to phi of lambda inverse x. You can see that that follows from this right here. Okay? Okay, so to summarize, what we've, we've defined fields, phi plus and phi minus, they're functions of space-time, and they transform in this simple way, which is in fact just the way that any uh, scalar field would transform uh, in, in, in space-time. And since these fields are nothing but the Fourier transforms of the alphas and the alpha daggers, we know that any operator in this Fox space can be written in terms of these operators. Okay? All right. So now we're finally ready to explain the resolution of the causality problems that we discussed in the first lecture. The basic idea, as we already said then, is that the theory places restrictions on what you can measure. Um, it may seem like the theory, why can't I measure anything I want, but the point is that uh, any sort of measurement is really an interaction. The experimentalist and her apparatus is really part of the physical world, and so the, what you can measure is determined by what kinds of interactions you can have. Uh, the interactions are determined by what terms appear in the Hamiltonian. So what this boils down to is that only certain kinds of operators are allowed to appear in the Hamiltonian. So we'll call those operators that are allowed to appear in the Hamiltonian, we'll call them observables. Okay. Um, and so observables are Hermitian operators, OI, and they, in general, are associated with a space-time point x, okay? And uh, the crucial property that these observables have to have in order to avoid problems with causality is that if we take any two of these observables, evaluate them at different space-time points, uh, any two observables will commute, the commutator will vanish, if x and y are space-like separated from each other, okay? 
So to understand the meaning of this condition, notice that any two points that are space-like separated, I can find a frame such that they, they both lie at t equals 0. They lie on an equal time surface. I can choose to be t equals 0. So here's my x uh, and y at t equals 0. And the statement that, this o, that the operator here and the operator here commute is just the statement that they are independent uh, operators, which certainly uh, makes, uh, makes intuitive sense. Right? Okay? And so um, the, 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 what I'm going to describe to you is that if we fail to have this property, then what will happen is that measurements of x will necessarily influence measurements of y in a way that violates causality. Okay? Now, this point is actually a little bit subtle because ordinary quantum mechanics does allow measurements at space-like separated points to influence each other, but not in a way that violates causality. So let's remind, let me remind you how that goes. So here I'm referring to the classic uh, setup that was introduced by Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen, or EPR. Okay? And so what did they do? They considered uh, the, uh, a setup where you have two particles with two spins, S1 and S2. So these are two different particles with two different uh, spin operators. And uh, we can separate them like this, okay? But we can arrange things so that they are prepared in a, in a state where the spins are correlated. So we, the spin state of this system can look like, for example, a spin singlet, which would look like this. Okay. So um, here, up and down, this, the first factor here refers to the spin state of S1, the second one to S2. Up means S, the z component of spin being plus a half, and down uh, refers to minus a half, okay, the usual sort of notation. And here the point is that if we have a measure, uh, an experimentalist A, an experimentalist B at these two points, uh, that measure these spins at prearranged times so that they're measuring them at space-like separated space-time uh, points, then A's measurement influence seems to influence that of B in the sense that if A measures the spin up, then B will always measure spin down and vice versa. Okay? Now, in, in, in quantum information theory, A is always called Alice and B is always called Bob, so let's, let's stick with that tradition. So, so Alice's measurement seems to be able to influence Bob's, the outcome of Bob's measurement. But if you think about this, you will see that there's actually no way to communicate faster than light in this way. Because, and the basic reason is that no matter what Alice does, Bob will always see spin up 50% of the time and spin down 50% of the time. There's no way to tell what Alice has done. It's only after their measurements have been made, Alice and Bob can get together and they can compare their measurements and they can find out that there's 100% anti-correlation between them. But they have to do, make that comparison, that has to be done in some causal way, so there's, there's no violation of any causality. And the claim here is that the basic reason why uh, there isn't any problem with causality here is that the spin operators, S1 and S2, commute with each other. Right? They're the spins of different particles, so these operators, if you like, live on different part, act on different parts of the space, and so it doesn't matter what order you act with them, uh, and that has to do with the fact that there's no communication faster than light here. Okay? And so, um, so to understand this point better, let's look at an example where, uh, let's try to imagine a situation where Alice and Bob can measure uh, two operators that do not commute with each other, that they can make space-like separated observations of operators that do not commute with each other. Now this can't happen, okay? So this is a, this is a fantasy example, okay? Um, so to cook up an example that's sort of familiar, let's suppose that there's a spin, okay? Uh, a single spin, and Alice can measure SZ, and Bob can measure uh, SX. Okay? So these are supposed to be different components of the same spin of the same particle, um, and, uh, but Alice and Bob are assumed somehow, I don't know how, uh, they can measure them uh, at these space-like separated points. Okay? And let's assume that the state of the uh, spin is just, uh, I'll write it this way, SZ equals one-half. 
Okay, I don't want to say up and down because now we're talking about different components of the, 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 the angular momentum. So it'll be prepared in a state of SC equals plus one half. Okay? Okay, so now let's assume, now let's, uh, let's say that Bob is trying to communicate with Alice. So the first situation is Bob does nothing. Bob just doesn't measure the spin, he just keeps it the same. Okay? Now what will Alice see? Well, Alice will see every time Alice measures the spin, or any, and we repeat the experiment, Alice will always get SZ equals plus one half, 100% of the time. Okay? But now, let's suppose that Bob decides to measure, do his measurement. He turns on his apparatus. Well, Bob will get half of the time, he will get SX equals plus a half, and half the time he'll get SX minus a half, right? That's, the, that's, the, that's what happens in this state. Okay, but now if Bob does that, the state of the system will be either Sx equals plus one half or Sx equals minus a half with equal probability. Okay, and then if Alice makes the measurement, Alice now will get Sz equals plus a half 50% of the time and Sz minus a half 50% of the time. So in the first situation, Alice always gets plus, plus one half. And in the second situation where Bob makes the measurement, she gets half, uh, half of the time she gets plus one half and half the time she gets minus one half. So this totally doesn't compute, <laughs> not commute, but compute. And this is due to the fact, this structure is due to the fact that, of course, SX and SZ are non-commuting operators, right? The fact that Bob's measurement, the outcome of Bob's measurement influences her measurement is a direct result of the fact that these two operators don't commute. Okay? So this is a crazy example, but it illustrates what is important about requiring that these operators uh, commute with each other. Okay? So um, yeah, I think that's all I wanted to say about that. Okay. So <clears throat> we need to write the theory in terms of observables that commute with each other at space-like separation. Okay, so let's ask, are these operators, uh, phi plus minus of x that we just constructed, are those observables? Okay, well, let's see. Do they commute or do they not commute at space-like separation? Well, it's pretty easy to see that phi plus of x, uh, phi uh, plus of y uh, commutes. These always commute whether it's space-like separated or not. The basic reason is that the annihilation operators commute with each other. And the same thing is true with the minus guy. Phi minus commutes with phi minus. Okay, so they commute with each other. Um, however, uh, phi plus of x, phi minus of y, that is, uh, that's something we actually have to think about a little bit. Okay, uh, let me give myself a little more room here. Let me pull this over here. So let's look at phi plus of x, phi minus of y, okay? So this is, uh, phi plus of x is basically the Fourier transform of uh, alpha. This is the Fourier transform of alpha dagger. Alpha and alpha dagger don't commute, so we've got, we've got some game here. So this is e to the minus i p dot x, and then for this guy we'll integrate over dq, e to the plus i q dot x, and then what the commutator that we have will be alpha of p uh, alpha dagger of q. Okay? All right. Well, we know what this commutator is. This commutator is just um, yeah, p q, right? This is the Lorentz invariant delta function. And then we can use this Lorentz invariant delta function to do, let's say, the q integral. Okay? And that will set q equal to p. And so, um, oh, excuse me. Uh, I made a mistake here. This y means that this right here should be y. This exponential should be y. And so if we do that, we'll have left over, we'll have the p integral left over, and then we'll have e to the minus i p dot x minus y, right? So the, the q got turned into a p, but here's x and here's a y, and there's a minus sign, so we get this. Um, and that's it, okay? So there it is. That's, that's the integral. Okay, and uh, we can write this in terms of, uh, we can, remember this thing has the delta function in it that puts it on the mass shell, uh, and so if we write this thing in terms of the three momentum integral, we get this to e of p, 
e to the minus i p dot x minus y. Okay? All right? Now, this integral looks very similar to the integral that we looked at in the first lecture, the integral that gave us the uh, Green's function from going to a point x to some uh, other point y, right? And the, the, there, uh, so we can use the same kind of argument uh, to argue that this, uh, this thing is non-zero, right? All we really care about is whether it's zero or not, okay? And, um, yeah, so uh, one thing we want to do is we want to give this a name, okay? This will, we'll call this delta plus, and again, this is a standard name. It's not something I made up, so don't blame me, okay? And um, so what is this thing, delta plus of x minus y? Uh, uh, we, can, we, can, we can use, again, we can use spherical coordinates for this. So we'll have a 2 pi cubed sitting outside. We'll have integral 0 to infinity p squared dp. So this is now the magnitude of the 3 momentum here. Uh, we have our integral d cos theta minus 1 to 1. And then we have our 2 pi coming from the phi integral. Um, right? And then we have our 2 d e of p downstairs, and then we finally have this exponential, which is e to the minus i uh, e p t minus p dot, uh, sorry, p x cos theta. Okay? This is following the same sorts of steps that we did in the first lecture, okay, with a slightly different uh, integral. And then what this thing turns into is 4 pi squared. Um, uh, and then there's integral 0 to infinity, p squared dp. Uh, this is now doing the theta integral. So we can do this. This is a cos theta, this, this thing here. We do, that, uh, that, uh, we do that integral. What do we get? We get some 2e of p here. And then we also get uh, sine px. Sorry, let me call this uh, let me call this argument just x. Okay, so I've been using x as the magnitude of the spatial part of this this guy right here. Let, let me now let me call it r. Okay, so what I'm doing here is uh, x mu is equal to t uh, r. Okay, so x mu the four vector has a zero component t and a uh, uh, you know the spatial part is r and r without a vector thing on it is just a magnitude. Okay, and then we have pr e to the minus i dp times t. Okay. So this is very similar to what we did in the first lecture. Uh, the only difference, actually, if you look back, is there's this, this factor here is, uh, is, is different. Um, and the basic point, as before, is just that this is an analytic function. If the imaginary part of t is less than 0, um, this becomes a damped exponential, and that tells me that this is an analytic function of t, and this analytic function of t cannot vanish over an interval of t without vanishing identically, and so this is non-zero. Okay? Okay. So uh, this commutator, so this delta plus function, does not vanish uh, outside the light cone. That's the bottom line. Okay? Okay. So. What are the implications of this? So we want to make observables out of phi plus and phi minus. Phi plus, phi minus uh, individually are not observable simply because they're not Hermitian. Uh, but we can easily form Hermitian combinations out of phi plus and phi minus. The simplest thing would be just phi plus of x plus phi minus of x. Okay, that's Hermitian because it's something plus its Hermitian conjugate. That's always the way to get something to be Hermitian. We can generalize this a little bit. Uh, we can add an arbitrary, multiply this by an arbitrary phase, and we get something Hermitian if we have the opposite phase here. So we just have an arbitrary phase theta. We could also multiply by a real number. Obviously, uh, if this is an, an observable, so will a real number times this. Um, and so we'll call this combination phi of x. All right, so let's just see if this is an observable. So we'll compute its commutator, phi x, phi y, and we will get terms from the cross terms. There's a phi plus here and a phi minus, a phi plus here and a phi minus. Uh, phi plus and phi minus commute with themselves, so we only get a contribution from a phi plus here, a phi minus here, and vice versa. Now notice for those terms, 
we get these opposite phases here, a product of these phases, so theta actually drops out. And what we get is delta plus x minus y minus delta plus y minus x. So we get a difference of these delta plus functions, which are just the commutators of phi plus and phi minus. Okay. So now, let's check to see whether this vanishes at space-like separated x minus y. So if x and y are space-like separated, we can choose a frame where x minus y mu looks like 0, 0, 0, r. So in other words, we're just choosing the z direction here to be along the direction of x minus y, and r is the magnitude. Okay? And then we can just write out what delta plus is, in this case, and there's some factors which I'm not going to uh, uh, bother to get right. Okay? And so I have something like this, sine pr over pr. Okay? And um, there is no e, uh, exponential e to the i uh, t type thing because I've chosen this particular frame. You see there's no time component here. Okay? And what you see is that this function right here is an even function of r. Okay, sine pr over pr is an even function of r. And so this function, delta plus, is even. So it is equal to delta plus of y minus x. Okay, so it's an even function, and that means that this combination right here is zero for space-like separated x minus y. Okay, now we could actually have understood this without any calculation at all because uh, we know that delta plus is Lorentz invariant, and we know that Lorentz transformations take delta, uh, x, uh, x minus y to minus itself. There's a proper Lorentz transformation that takes us to that, and since we have to integrate over all, um, well, and so, th well, th sorry, so that already tells us that these two things are equal and opposite. Since they're Lorentz invariant and they're related by a Lorentz transformation, this should be equal to that. Okay? However, um, let's also check, uh, as a sanity check, let's also check that this combination right here does not vanish if x minus y is time-like. Okay? So let's check that. Okay? So if instead x minus y is time-like, we can now choose a frame where x minus y looks like t, 0, 0, 0. So now we just choose the t direction to be in the direction of x minus y. And if we now go ahead and compute what this is, there's again some factors. 0 to infinity uh, p dp e to the minus i e p t over, uh, uh, oh, sorry, over e p, right. Okay? So we get something like this. And now you see this thing here comes in the exponent, this t comes in the exponent, and this is, this is certainly not equal to delta uh, plus of y minus x. Because if we have y minus x, we would be changing the sign of t, and this, there's no relationship between that. Okay? And again, this is related to the fact that uh, uh, there is not a Lorentz transformation that takes plus t to minus t. There's no proper Lorentz transformation that does that, and so uh, it is not necessary that this thing vanishes for time like, uh, time like x minus y, and in fact it does not. Okay? Okay. Okay, so we succeeded, okay? We found that this particular combination up here is, in fact, uh, an observable. Now, uh, <clears throat> and this works for any value of this theta, but really, this theta is actually kind of trivial because I could always absorb these phases into a redefinition of the alphas and the betas. So I could define my alpha to be uh, e to the i theta alpha, and then my alpha dagger would have an e to the minus i theta, and uh, this amounts to just rephasing all of our states by theta. doesn't change anything. So from now on, I'm just going to drop these terms right here. Uh, so we're just going to say that <coughs> we're just going to define phi to be phi plus of x plus phi minus of x. Okay, okay. Uh, so now that we have this one observable, we can make an infinite number of new observables just by taking local functions of this phi and its derivatives. 
So it's easy to check that, for example, phi squared of x, phi cubed of x, and so on, all of these things are observables, okay? Any of these things, commutator with any of these other things, vanishes if the points are space-like separated. You can also take derivatives, okay, of x, and so on. Derivatives of powers, powers of derivatives, all these things uh, have this property. So now we have uh, a large number of, of, of these things, okay? All right? And notice that the important point is that, uh, that this guy right here has got both annihilation and creation operators in it, right? This is proportional to an annihilation operator, this to a creation operator. And so all of these operators, by itself and all of these other operators, always contain both creation and annihilation operators. So when we get around to finally constructing Hamiltonians and interacting theories, we'll have to construct them out of these guys, and they will necessarily relate uh, processes that create and destroy particles. Okay? Okay, so the way we did this is that we, uh, we th this here was just the simplest combination of phi plus and phi minus. And so you can ask, well, are there other combinations of phi plus and phi minus? Can I get clever and make other uh, combinations which are observables? Uh, so you could try, and you could try to make things that say, look, I really don't like creation and destruction of particles, or I just want to know whether it's possible to avoid that or not. It's an interesting question. Um, so you can try to make things like phi plus of x, phi minus of x. Okay, let's call that O. Okay, so you can say, okay, here's an operator, it's local. Uh, this does not create or destroy particles because it's proportional to a product of an annihilation operator and a creation operator. Actually, I think I want to do plus, I want to do, yeah, I want to do plus minus like this. Anyway, it doesn't matter so much. Okay, so um, it's, it's proportional, it's a, this is a one-body operator in the language that I've been talking about. Okay. And so you can actually check, it's a nice exercise to check that this thing is, uh, in fact, not uh, an observable. So if we compute O of X, O of Y, for example, what do we get? We get things like uh, delta plus uh, X minus Y, um, and then we get uh, phi minus X phi plus Y, minus delta plus of x minus, uh, sorry, what do we get? Uh, minus y minus x, uh, phi plus of y, phi minus of x, okay? So anyway, you get something, and this is clearly not zero. It would have to be zero as an operator, and it's very easy to convince yourself that this is not zero, okay? So you can ask, well, is there a proof? Is there some proof that all of the observables can be made out of local functions of phi. Um, I suspect that you can prove that. I've never seen a proof of that. Uh, so, but I think it's true. That's sort of the, 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 the status. Okay? All right. Okay. So, um, where are we? Okay, uh, we're actually, I would claim, right back to where we started, okay, because what is phi, right? What is phi? Phi, you can now write it out, it is, uh, it's given by the, the Lorentz invariant integral, and then we have a piece which is alpha of p e to the minus i p dot x plus alpha dagger of p e to the plus i p dot x, okay? And uh, there's a very simple way to characterize what this uh, phi actually is. It is simply the most general solution to this operator equation, namely the Klein-Gordon equation, right? It's easy to see that this equation is satisfied by this right here, okay, because this box right here acts only on x, so it acts on these exponentials right here, and uh, it pulls down a power of minus p squared, minus because there's a complex exponential here, and p squared is m squared, and so this, uh, this equation of motion, the Klein-Gordon equation, is satisfied by this. But not only that, uh, this is actually the most general solution to 
the Klein-Gordon equation. Okay? It's the most general solution to the Klein-Gordon equation because I just have arbitrary uh, operator coefficients here. Okay? On the other hand, uh, phi plus and phi minus, okay, they also satisfy the same equation because let's look at phi plus, for example, right? Phi plus is Lorentz invariant integral alpha of p e to the minus i p dot x. In other words, it's just the first term here in this thing. Phi plus also satisfies the Klein-Gordon equation, okay? But remember that here, this is not the most general solution because it contains only this positive uh, frequency part. And there's no local way of characterizing it like this, okay? It's Lorentz invariant, but it's not, you can't sort of characterize this as the most general solution of phi satisfying a certain set of local uh, conditions, okay? So the, the, the spirit of the thing is that this right here, uh, that, that phi is nothing but a, uh, a quantum field. It is, it, we have basically, we could have turned this whole thing around and just said, well, look, give me the most general solution to this equation right here, um, uh, operator solution to that, and I would have written this down, and we would have, we would have been on our merry way, okay? So in fact, that is what we will do in the next lecture, the lecture following this one. We'll basically reverse things. We'll say, let's start with a quantum theory uh, of a field, and uh, let's see what we get. Okay? Now, both of these points of view are useful. And what we did here was starting from descriptions of particles, quantum particles, and work our way and argue that what we needed was actually a quantum field. Right? And next time, we'll just start with quantum fields and develop the theory from that point of view. Uh, and we'll see that both, both of these points of view are actually very useful.